The LA Clippers returned home on Sunday night and played the Atlanta Hawks in hopes to break their five game losing streak, but it would not be the case. They would blow an 11 point lead in the fourth quarter after trailing by as many as 16 and ultimately lost a heartbreaker. One of the most heartbreaking defeats of the season. What did we learn from this one? And are the Clippers just doomed? What was the biggest reason they lost? Going to be talking about it all on today's Locked On Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. I'm your host, Darian Viziri, in my 18th season as a Clipper fan. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. And of course, subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where a vlog of the game I attended on Sunday night will be up. It was a good game, got some good footage in there. You can see what it was like inside. Of course, remember to subscribe also to Locked On Clippers on YouTube. And remember, we are streaming free and available on all podcasting platforms. But on the YouTube, make sure you subscribe and comment on today's pin question. And that is, it's been a lot of debate on Twitter tonight and in circles around Clipper Nation. What was the biggest reason the Clippers lost this one? Because we actually saw some adjustments from Ty Lue in this game. And we're going to talk about those. I think each quarter spelled a different kind of game for the Clippers based on the lineups that they used. And... Let's just get right into it, honestly. And I will I will go over the positives because I think there are some positives to take. And then we'll be looking at the big picture, as always, at the end. That will be what we close it with. So let's just get it started with this one. Clippers looking to break the five-game losing skid, return home the first of a five-game homestand against the really struggling and reportedly dysfunctional Atlanta Hawks team this year who brought DeJounte Murray in to try to form a nice backcourt tandem with Trey Young and give Trey Young that second all-star, DeJounte having been an all-star with the Spurs. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I actually watched a good amount of their games before I went to Qatar for the World Cup, and they were 11-5, and and it was looking really good, exactly like the Hawks fans envisioned it. But since then, there's been some injuries here and there. I mean, Clint Capella did not play in this contest, but just a lot of dysfunction, and they're not a very deep team. The only really notable bench player they have is Bojan, I'm sorry, Bogdan Bogdanovich, but also Onyeka Kongwu, who's familiar to Southern California basketball fans as a former USC Trojan, and of course on those Chino Hills High School teams with the balls, with the Ball Brothers. And Onyeka Kongwu had some incredibly impressive moments in this game. I just want to say that. But overall... The Hawks have been really struggling lately. There's been a lot of talk about Nate McMillan being fired or resigning and having problems with Trey Young and whatnot. So they're not in good form at all. They come in having gotten smashed by the Lakers on Friday. And the Clippers made an adjustment in this game. No Paul George and Luke Kennard still out. Luke Kennard with the calf injury that he re-injured and strained in the Minnesota game, the last game the Clippers played. And Paul George missing his second consecutive game with that ankle injury. As we saw, he did not look the same against the Denver Nuggets last Thursday on TNT. So that's okay. The adjustment made by Ty Lue was Nico Batum starting in place of... Why am I blanking on his name? I'm sorry. Instead of Paul George. And then Terrence Mann starting instead of Reggie Jackson. So Reggie Jackson getting demoted to the bench? I mean, if you recall the last episode, if you listened, I said I think he should be taken out of the rotation entirely and just be a vibes guy. And what I mean by a vibes guy is just somebody to add morale on the bench. You know, just be a chemistry guy in terms of the a locker room guy. Because he doesn't bring enough to the table. Yeah, he'll explode for his 20-point games here and there. And and catch-and-shoot Reggie fits better alongside Kawhi and Paul than John Wall, maybe. Those are the arguments for him playing. And he's one of only two point guards outside of young Jason Preston on this roster. However, he's too inconsistent offensively. He often bites off more than he can chew and we have better players than him. And what I mean by that is taking reckless shots and running more pick-and-rolls than he needs to run. Defensively, his effort really is poor most nights. And... 
when he's making shots, it'll inc- it'll add to his effort. But it's very contingent on if he's making shots. He's not a great passer. He dribbles a lot. And as much as I love the guy, he's just getting older and he's played really hard for us the last couple of years. So I respect and understand the decision for Ty Lue to put him on the bench. And what you saw in that starting lineup was exactly what you'd expect with that lineup. One through four, the Clippers can switch everything. And then with Zubats, they're going to go drop coverage. And in the beginning, it was really good. Kawhi got off to a solid start. Terrence Mann got off to a solid start, had seven points in the first quarter, and the Clippers were up 22-19 to before bringing in a familiar kind of look. But not really, honestly. Moses Brown was out there, which I don't think he should be playing in games that matter personally, which is games against decent teams. But there is an argument to be made for Moses Brown to play in certain games like tonight, for example, because he actually did do some good things, but mainly in the second half, in my opinion. But Moses Brown was out there with Kawhi Leonard and then a three-guard set. Reggie Jackson, John Wall together, which I already don't like, and then Norman Powell at the three. So three guys, six, four, and under, and immediately the game changed. The Hawks actually had some pretty... Tall guys off the bench like rookie Jalen Johnson. And he was actually taking advantage of some size on rolls and different scenarios. And you also had A.J. Griffin who played 11 minutes. And he was 3 for 3 a couple times. Shot over the top. But I'm sorry. Jalen Johnson is a sophomore, not a rookie. He was the 20th pick in the draft in the twenty in last year's draft, 2021 draft. So he actually had a really solid impact in this game. He only averages 5 points a night. But in this game, he had 13 off the bench, and he had a really good second quarter, as did the entire Hawks team. The Clippers led by one after one, 26-25, but the second quarter was an astonishing 41-26 win in favor of Atlanta, and a huge reason was because of those th- that three-guard set, the dreaded three-guard set. And the craziest part is when Kawhi had to go take his rest, you don't have Paul George tonight, Terrence Mann was playing as the second tallest guy in the lineup. So essentially, if you want to talk positional basketball, he's playing power forward, which is way too small. And you just saw there's no resistance. If the Clippers want to switch those three guards, it's it's your pick of the litter if you're the Hawks. I mean, either one, going at John Wall, Norman Powell, or Reggie Jackson is a favorable matchup. And Reggie Jackson was just poor defensively again. I thought John Wall's effort in the first half on defense was really pathetic, if I'm being Honestly, just just honest, you know, not sugarcoating it. I think both of their efforts on defense were poor. And obviously, it's just too small, especially with Moses Brown on the back line. You know, if Moses Brown is helping you and contesting a shot, he's not a good second jumper. You know what I'm saying? He's not that quick on his feet. So if he's going up to contest shots, he's not getting that rebound. Someone's going to have to sink and get a body on his man. So if you can't stay in front of the ball and Moses Brown is out there as your line of defense on the back line, yeah, you may be able to deter as the help man, Moses may be able to play good help defense and deter the initial shot, but someone's got to follow it up. And we don't have that many, we don't have the size to, on the offensive glass. So that's a problem. And then on offense, you know what the other team's going to do when guys like John Wall, Norman Powell, and Reggie are out there together. If they're not asking for a screen from Moses, if anyone else is setting a screen, whether it be Terrence or any of those guards, They're just going to switch. And now you're playing one-on-one. Pick, choose who goes one-on-one for the Clippers. It became very stagnant. It was ugly basketball and tough to watch. And at the end of the second quarter, the Clippers actually cut it back down to 10. They were down by as many as 16. And then a catastrophic last 30 seconds where they allowed seven points, including a lob. And then John Wall threw threw the ball to Kawhi with like seven seconds left in the second quarter and Kawhi wasn't looking and DeAndre Hunter came and swooped in and took the ball and jammed it down which gave the Hawks a 14 point lead going into the half 66 to 52 the third quarter though everything changed the Clippers kept that same starting lineup to start with that third quarter and finally the Hawks just started missing shots and Marcus Morris who was missing everything in the first half like literally everything started to knock shots shots down and Kawhi and Terrence kept being Kawhi and Terrence pushing the pace off of misses and finally the Hawks were starting to miss a lot of shots and the Clippers were getting stops Kawhi Terrence pushing the pace and Marcus Morris hit three threes in the third quarter and the Clippers outscored the Hawks 
35 to 19 in the third. And through all this, I haven't even mentioned his name yet, but Ivica Zubats had one of his best games in a long while in this one. He was active on the glass on both ends. His defense and pick and roll throughout the game until the late in the fourth quarter, which I'll talk about in a sec, was really good. He was hitting bas- uh, shots around the basket, setting good screens, just doing his Zubats thing. I kept saying all game he was going to go for a 20-20 game, and he almost did. He almost did. He finished with 17 points and 18 boards in 38 minutes on 6 for 9 shooting in 5 for 6 from deep so even in the first half he and Kawhi were the only ones playing well to me in the first half but you saw better from Norm and John and the big change that Tyloo made in the second half he didn't play Reggie at all which is much closer to what I want and you saw it pay dividends and in the beginning of the fourth quarter I thought Norman Powell and John Wall were doing a really good job leading that second unit John Wall had a much better second half he created so many good looks if you go back and watch the tape I didn't notice it in live time but I rewatched the fourth quarter he created a ton of good looks getting downhill and when guys were at times loading up on him he found senior for an open shot I don't think he made it but There were a couple times also, and I think this really benefits John Wall to play with the center, whether it be Zoo or Moses Brown, because if he's getting screens from wings and guards, they're just going to switch and force him to play one-on-one. And you know teams are going to sag off on him. But with Moses, that's a big body where he can turn the corner coming off those screens, and he found Moses for two straight buckets on rolls around the rim. And I thought in the second half, Moses Brown did a really decent job on the glass and finishing around the rim. The only thing is, on the pick and rolls, you just need to have someone rotating on his man because if he steps up to help you, the ball handler, get uh, fighting over a screen, or the guy guarding the ball handler fighting over a screen, someone has to take his man. It's not like with Zubots where he can show on the ball handler and then recover to his own man all at once. He can't really do that. So the rotations have to be sharp, and at times they weren't late in that uh, or right, right before Moses Brown went out of the game. But Moses Brown came out of the game in the fourth quarter, and the Clippers were up 102-91 to after a Kawhi left corner three in the fourth. And mind you, they went on an 18-2 to run to make it 83-79 in the third. So that was all Terrence Mann, you know, rebounding, defending, getting to the basket in transition, Kawhi, hitting mid-range shots, also getting to the foul line, pushing the pace off misses, Zubats following up shots, Marcus Morris finally hitting shots, Nico Batum finally hit a shot in the corner from three, and the Clippers were up by 11. And how did they blow the game up 102-91 in the fourth? Gonna be talking about the crux of the choke, if you want to call it that, coming up. Go to TurboTax and don't do your taxes. Meet with an expert who will do them for you. TurboTax experts can relieve you from the stress of taxes and file for you so you can do so. Not taxes. Show your eyes things that are not taxes. Unpack a moving box of not taxes. Taste not taxes. Sing not taxes a lullaby. Hope not taxes sleeps through the night. Grab a saddle and ride in not taxes into the sunset. With the TurboTax 100% expert guarantee, an expert will do your taxes from start to finish so you can relax. Feels good to be done with your taxes, doesn't it? Go to TurboTax and don't do your taxes. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. Intuit, shout out to the Intuit Dome, TurboTax, full service products only. Video meeting while expert does your taxes required. See guaranteed details at TurboTax.com slash guarantee. All right, let's get back to it. The Clippers were up 102-91 in the fourth quarter. And then at with the score 102 to 96, the Clippers did something that when I was at the game uh, on Sunday night, I literally said, I screamed out, no, when he did it. But Ty Lu took Terrence Mann out of the game alongside John Wall, who it was time for him to come out, for Nico Batum and Marcus Morris Sr. Nico Batum, it was a good substitution because I thought when the Clippers played really well in that third quarter, Nico did a great job defensively, whether it be going over screens and being in guards rear view like Trey or DeJounte, or when he was just switched one-on-one guarding DeJounte or various guys, did a really good job contesting and staying in front. Just some really, really great stuff from Nico. But... 
Terrence Mann, I want to actually check Terrence Mann's minutes because if he hadn't sat out at that point, I understand the decision from Ty Lue, but I, I could have sworn he came out of the game in the third quarter. He did. At the 413 mark of the third quarter, Norman Powell came in for Terrence Mann, and then Terrence Mann came in with 56 seconds left in the third. So Terrence Mann coming out with five minutes left after he was playing really well. Pretty sure he had 14 points and seven rebounds at that point of the game. On five for 11 shooting, and Senior at the time, I want to say was four for 14. So, and three for nine from deep. So I thought that was a questionable decision. Now here is what happened right after that substitution. Zubats got an offensive foul on they on a play where they blitzed Kawhi in the pick and roll. Zu got the ball, and usually Zu makes the right read on these four-on-three situations and swings the ball to the open shooter. Norman Powell, in this case, was the wide open shooter in the right corner. And I don't know if he saw DeJounte Murray on the right wing guarding, I forget who it was, but he was guarding someone else. But you know how they do it. He did a good job of kind of being in between both the corner man and the wing man. So maybe DeJounte Murray deterred Zubats for a second and made him second think that pass. But overall, he should have thrown it, and I think it would have gotten there. Zubats then runs into the rotating man, I forget who it was, and was co- and committed an offensive foul. Then on the following defensive possession, Nico Batum fouls Trey Young, but it was a very questionable call. I thought in the arena they were going to challenge it. It was a little body contact by Nico that they called it, but it was really ticky-tack. I think, in hindsight, the Clippers should have called it because I don't remember the Clippers using their challenge, and they didn't challenge it. Trey Young, and because they should have challenged it, in my opinion, because Trey Young is an automatic two points at the line. So that made it 102-98, and then Nico turned the ball over on an inbounds pass on our own baseline. Or should I say, yeah, on offense, on our offensive side of the court. Turned the ball over. DeAndre Hunter went and scored and made it 100 to 102. And then on the following offensive possession, Norman Powell kind of turned down a mid range coming off a screen and tried to go all the way to the rim. I pref- I think there were two times in this in the second half where Norman Powell turned down a mid range to just go right at the rim and take a very reckless, out of control kind of shot. And on this one, you gotta give credit to Onyeka Kongwu, who made an amazing block that ended up leading to two points for Dejounte Murray on the other end that tied the game at 102. And Onyeka Kongwu didn't just do that; he did a really good job switching on a Kawhi and making it so that the the Hawks could switch one to five. And it forced a little more one-on-one play from the Clippers late. So you got to give credit to him. He was really impressive in this game. His five points and nine rebounds won't do him justice at all. He had three blocks, though. That does him a little more justice. And two for six in the field. But the defense that he provided in that fourth quarter was really noticeable. But Clippers come off the timeout. 102-102. And Kawhi Leonard gets to the foul line. Makes them both. And then Marcus Morris hits a contested right wing mid range to put the Clippers up 106 102 with 234 left. I was feeling really good here. And I want to say before that possession and after that possession, so on either side of that possession on offense for the Clippers, Kawhi Leonard created a great look from three twice. One by Nico Batum. He missed it. That would have put the Clippers up 107 to 102. And then Norman Powell would have put the Clippers up 109-102 and probably ended the game. Norm missed a lot of decent looks that he always makes. And on the other end, DeJounte Murray had a nice shot on Nico Batum. Just just a good shot, right? Good player. Made it a two-point game. And then Kawhi Leonard again went to the pick and roll, this time putting Trey Young in the action, which you see a lot of teams do against the Hawks to try to make Trey Young defend. Trey Young hedged. Nico Batum got the ball on a four-on-three. And Marcus Morris, he had the right idea, but the Hawks' length ended up getting a steal. He tried to pass to Norman Powell in the corner. They got a steal and scored on the other end, and the game was tied at 106. Then the last possession, Kawhi Leonard with seven on the shot clock settled for a contested three over DeAndre Hunter. He missed long. Terrence Mann, I, I believe it was, got the offensive rebound. And then Marcus Morris Sr., yeah, it was Terrence Mann. So, I'm sorry. He had 14 points and seven boards when he came out. Had That was his eighth rebound. Gave it to Marcus Morris Sr., 
who pump faked and got his guy in the air. I thought he was going to step into the mid-range to tie the game, but he stepped back for three to win the game. And let me know what you think also in the comments. Was that the right decision? I know threes are encouraged when they're open, but it is a little awkward, at least for me as a player. I don't know about senior. But when you pump fake and step into the mid-range, that's very natural. The pump fake step in and then step back out to the three, I don't know, especially he, especially the fact that he wasn't shooting threes well in this game. He was three for nine at that point. He probably should have taken that mid-range just for the tie, especially with us being at home. But he went for the jugular. He went for the win. I can't believe he missed because he was so open. And the Clippers played the foul game. Trey Young iced it, no pun intended, and that was it. Clippers lose it 112-108, to a heartbreaking defeat. I'm going to talk about where we can point. You know, there's been a lot of talk I've heard. A lot of different stories about why the Clippers lost with a lot, a lot of people blaming Ty Lue. I'm going to talk about where I, you know, the percentage of blame I put on each side and what good things we saw. Is there any reason to be optimistic going into the game against Lucas Mavs on Tuesday? Going to be talking about that on the other side coming up. You know what I really miss having to start my mornings? Built Bar. I really loved having it before the gym. It was just great to wake up and just get something that wasn't too heavy. It's so sweet. It's a delicious treat that tastes like a candy bar with its chewy interior. If you want a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, then you got to try it. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year, especially getting a lot of protein in, because you already know we're trying to get those gains in. And if you're like me and want to get those gains in or just want to get healthier, we've got some for you. It's Built Bar. It's actually tasty, and I'm not just saying that because I have to read these ads. I actually think they are good. And what makes them good? Well, let's begin with the fact that they're covered in 100% real chocolate. And they come in unbelievably f different flavors. My favorite is kind of, I actually kind of go with raspberry right now is my favorite of the four I've tried. They have flavors though like peanut butter brownie, which I haven't tried, coconut almond, which I also haven't tried, and churro, which is making me go crazy the fact that I haven't tried it. I'm not sure how they do it, but these belt bars taste like a candy bar while also maintaining amazing macros. And what's better is they are healthy. Only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years we've been talking about ordering your built bars at built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart. That's right, head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-box bar with our hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later. All right. So where do you put the blame in a game like this? I went on Twitter after the game, and it was just all, it's all Ty Lue's fault. Ty Lue's terrible. And I was just kind of wondering why. But it's because they saw what I saw, and that was that they took Terrence Mann out of the game. And when they did that, the Clippers were up 102-96, and then they ended up losing 112-108. to So 112-96, that means you got outscored 16-6 to it for the rest of the game? Man, that is just disappointing. And, I mean, Ty Lue... He's just had a tough season. And after the game, he said he liked a lot of good things that he saw. But he also said that from Lu Lucas Hahn, uh, former host of Locked on Clippers, said that he said this was a positive night for me. Ty Lue said that. And if that's the case, I mean, wow. I expect a lot more competitive fire from Ty. I think a lot of people are getting on the fact that he just looks complacent out there. I know he's not playing. I want to make that clear. I don't want to blame Ty Lue so much in this game because I think the Clipper players that stretch, the reason why I listed out those plays that caused the downfalls because I want you, the fan, to see if you're really, really leaning on the fact that it's all Ty Lue's fault for one, the taking Terrence out of the game when we were up by six, and then the second one, which was the initial run where the Clippers it was 22 to 19 when Reggie Jackson, Norman Powell, and John Wall played together. And by the time Reggie came out, and he was the first one of those three guards to come out, it was 40 to 30. So that is a full on 13 point swing in that time because of a thing that we've said is already, it should be malpractice to play three of those smaller guards at once. So you could point to Ty Lue for having some portion of the blame tonight, especially the fact that we threw the two or three same coverages at Trey Young late in the game. And then the, the Terrence Mann situation. But let's also be 100% honest, starting from the top. 
Nico Batum, six points, five rebounds, three assists. Thought he played really good defense, but the turnover where he threw the ball away underneath our own basket uh, was just, or I'm sorry, underneath, I guess you can say, it depends what you, <laughs> what you qualify as the own basket. The basket we're trying to score on, he threw the ball away and it led to two points late in the game. That was just huge. And then he also missed a big three and was one for five from deep in this game. And almost every single one was a great look. So Nico Batum, he did some really good things. Is it just his fault we lost because he was one for five? Obviously not. But it's a contributing factor that Ty Lue's thing, Nico Batum missed a couple open shots and a terrible turnover. Kawhi Leonard, 29 points, seven boards, four assists, two steals. I thought, and he didn't have any turnovers, which is good. And the Clippers only turned the ball over 11 times in this one, so that's a little better. They're getting better at that. But Kawhi, and he played 38 minutes too, which is a little bit much, honestly, but considering the Clippers didn't have Paul George, it's, I understand. Nine for 23, so he didn't end up shooting that great. The one thing you really like to see, though, is two for four from deep, but one of those misses he probably shouldn't have even taken was that last three. I would much prefer to him to try to get into the mid-range area and shoot from there and hope, honestly start his move from the wing so maybe he'll even attract a help defender. I thought that was a tough ending for Kawhi to play really well and then go you know, one for three in the last minute was a little tough, but I still think he did enough for the Clippers to win. I think guys should have knocked down shots, but at the same time, Trey Young played better than him at the end of the game, and the superstars are paid to win those games. So Kawhi, did he do anything really that wrong? Eh, besides the missed three, you know, and I'm not saying it's wrong for missing. Missing happens. It just happens, and then shots don't fall. You know, you got you want to hit, as a player, you say, I should have hit that. Absolutely, but conceptually and like, you know, I'm okay with the process. If, if a superstar misses shots, at least he's taking shots. You know, I'm happy that Kawhi shot over 20 times. I said I wanted to see that going in. So, 9 for 23. I think I still think, though, you know, you would have liked to see one of those last ones go down. Uh, he definitely is not scratch-free of blame in this one, in my opinion. Marcus Morris, speaking of not scratch-free of blame, 15 and 6. He was 3 for 10 from deep, including a huge miss at the end of the game. And defensively, actually made some big plays. A huge block, an amazing rotation in the fourth quarter. I think it was a Kongu that went up for the dunk. It was such a great block. I was pretty impressed there from him. But overall, he played 30 minutes, should be playing less. Six for 16 from the field. Just, I don't know. If it's a Zubats, 17 points and 18 rebounds. Thought he was great. Six for nine from the field. Could he have played a little better defense and drop coverage in the end? Maybe stepped up a little bit? Maybe. Probably. But overall, he played really well. Terrence Mann played 35 minutes. In this game, he, he put a should, should have probably played 38, 39, like 38 to 40. He can, if anybody can play that kind of those kind of minutes, it's Terrence. He had 14 points, eight rebounds, four assists, two steals, only one turnover, and he handled the ball a good amount. Five for eleven from the field and one for two from deep, and made all his free throws. And Ty said that we're just getting used to trying to play Terrence a little more at point guard after the game. So hopefully we continue to see that going forward because, again, number 14 helps you win basketball games. It's so obvious. And in this one, he was spectacular again, and you just don't like to see him come out of the game with five minutes to go. If he had played the whole game, he would have gone to, I think, 39 minutes or 40 and honestly, that's okay. I know the minutes distribution probably it just looks more ac like it looks more balanced with senior playing thirty and Terrence playing thirty five as opposed to thirty nine minutes for Terrence or, and twenty five for senior. But hey, that's what's gonna happen if the Clippers are gonna win without Paul George. Remember, Paul George and Luke Kennard were out. So, and then the bench, Reggie Jackson only played eight minutes. He was a the team a team worst minus thirteen. He had a donut and shot two shots. I don't need to say anything more about Reg. I love the guy, but. He needs to stay on the bench. Moses Brown played 10 minutes, and he almost got a double-double in those 10 minutes. Eight points and 10 rebounds. So he did his thing. I thought he was better in the second half. He was a minus eight, though. So, I mean, that does tell a little bit of the story. I think the Clippers are really vulnerable in pick and roll when he's in. And then John Wall played 22 minutes. Thought it was a tale of two halves for him. Didn't have a good first half. Really liked what I saw in the second half on the rewatch especially. Five points and five assists. Two turnovers for him, though. Two for eight from the field. One for three from deep. You'd like to see him shoot a little bit better than that. And then Norman Powell just had a tough shooting night. There were a couple times where he could have shot a mid-range and went into a reckless shot. 14 points, four assists, three rebounds for him on three for 13 shooting. Two for five from deep, though, but it was one big miss he had late in the game. But three for 13 is just no good. However, he's been really good lately, so 
you know, the bad games are going to happen for him. The, the Clippers only shot 39% from the field in this one and 33% from deep, which is no bueno. The Hawks shot only 31% from deep, but they shot 49% from the field. And Trey Young, who was pretty quiet for most of the game, ended up with 30 points and 8 assists on 9 for 17 shooting and 3 for 6 from deep and 9 for 9 from the line. He took over that game. DeAndre Hunter, I thought, was really good on both ends. I'm really big on DeAndre Hunter. 20 points and 4 boards on 8 for 13 shooting. And John Collins was the fourth starter in double figures for them with 13 points and 9 boards on 6 for 10 shooting. And then the only other player in double figures for them was Jalen Johnson off the bench, who I mentioned earlier with 13. Subscribe to Locked On Clippers and let me know what you thought was the biggest reason the Clippers lost this game. Remember to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod if you want to interact or listen to my stuff. And remember to subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where a vlog of this game will be up on Monday afternoon. Thank you so much. Go Clippers.